Father, we thank you for the country of India, our nation, Lord, where there are million gods and goddesses. We pray, O oh God, that your presence would penetrate right from the Himalayas down to Cape Comrin, from the city of Bombay to old Calcutta, Lord, that your presence would touch your people. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that thou would birth in your people, Lord, that spiritual awakening, Lord, that they would turn to your God. Lord there are so many people who are lost in darkness and idolatry Lord we pray oh God that the marvelous gospel would touch them and draw their hearts closer to the oh father Lord we pray oh God that your word would be preached to the millions and thousands of people God who are in our nation who haven't heard about Jesus we pray oh God for Lord the interior tribal area so oh God we pray oh God that thou would touch those people oh God and we pray oh God that thou would touch their lives we pray for Lord the villages oh God where the gospel has to reach your people oh God there are no scriptures in many indian languages oh God Lord we pray oh God that thou would raise up people Lord who would be able to bring the gospel in their mother tongue oh father Lord we pray for the needy of our nation oh God especially Lord the manner is children of god lord we pray oh god that thou would enable them lord that they would be able to glorify your name oh god we pray oh god that thou would make the church as a light and a salt in a place oh god where people are not sensitive towards your voice oh god lord that you would enable lord the church to be a sending church lord we pray oh god that thou would remove lord the lukewarmness in the church of god and we pray for Lord the leaders of our church of God that they would be able to Lord carry forth your word of God in its power of God we once again thank you Lord for this privilege and we want to come at Lord the land of India in your loving hands that thou would visit in a very special way in reviving and Lord preparing them for your coming in Jesus name we pray Lord amen I don't know about you, um, but I'm tired. I know for many, this lockdown hasn't been a time for rest and relaxation. No, in fact, the opposite. For many, this lockdown has just led to greater busyness. 
And I know that many of you are tired and weary. I know that many of you are having to work from home and having to work late nights to finish all that you need to get done. I know that many parents are not only working from home, but they're having to take care of their children and homeschool them from home. Uh, I know that many of our teachers are, are working double shifts, uh, not just teaching in the classroom, but now having to teach online as well. And I know that many of our students are having to, to take these online courses and, and finish and complete their studies during all of this turmoil. I know that for many of us, this is a time of great busyness where we're tired and weary. Well, I want to encourage you simply this afternoon by joining your attention to the God who cares for the tired and the weary. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31, we read these beautiful verses where God tells us, Have you not known and have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might he increases strength even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall be exhausted but they who wait for the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint if you're tired and you're weary and in need of strength God's word tells us to wait on him and he will give us strength because he does not grow tired or weary. One of the ways we wait upon the Lord is to place our hope and our trust upon his word, particularly his promises. And so in this lesson or in this uh, message, I want to draw your attention to three more promises of God, but three of his promises he gives to the tired. The first one I want to draw your attention to is found in Colossians 1 verse 17, but I want to read from verse 15. Uh, it, we read in Colossians 1 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And here's the verse. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That might not seem like it, but God has given us a beautiful promise in that verse. And what is that promise? Well, it's simply this. Jesus is in control. Jesus is holding everything together. Jesus has you in his hands. Jesus is not only the creator of all things. Jesus is not only before all things and therefore uh, preeminent over all things. But Jesus sustains and governs and upholds all things. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us something similar, doesn't it? Uh, it says there of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe with a power, with, by his word of his power. Now, first and foremost, uh, this tells us that Jesus indeed is God of God. In the Old Testament, we are told repeatedly that God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Well, when we turn to the New Testament, we see that Jesus is described as the creator and sustainer. Why? Well, because he is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the divine son of the Father. Not only that, this verse is drawing our attention to this promise that Jesus, as the divine Son of God, is in control. And who is this promise for? Well, it's for all of us. All of us need to realize, believer, unbeliever alike, all of us need to realize that we are not in control. We are not sovereign. This world and our lives is not held together by our hands. Not just the world out there, but your world, your family, your work, your life, all of it, in all of it, you are not in control. We are not sovereign. God is. Christ is. Now, why bring this out? Why, why draw your attention to this promise? Well, because when we see this promise, we come to realize that, wait a minute, 
Life doesn't depend on me. Everything just doesn't depend upon my strength. And when we realize that, then we can rest secure in Christ who is in control. Now, this is an important aspect to, to take note of because all of us have certain responsibilities, whether it's responsibilities at work or in the family or at home. All of us have, have certain expectations that have been placed upon us. All of us have certain things that are dependent upon us. And in light of all these things, it's very easy to so overwork yourself that you work yourself to death. It's so easy to be so overwhelmed by all these responsibilities that you're constantly stressed and worried. Beloved, I want to suggest to you that this promise that Jesus is in control is a promise that enables you to rest. In fact, it enables you to sleep. We need to be very clear. One of the simplest and greatest solutions to being tired is the simplest solution, and that is to get rest, to enjoy a good night's rest. And so often one of the reasons we can't enjoy rest, one of the reasons we struggle to sleep is because we get so worried that things aren't going to happen if we aren't busy. We think that to ourselves that if we aren't working, things won't get done or, or, or simply things won't be accomplished. Things will fall apart. Yet this promise gives us the assurance that Jesus is actually in control. Jesus is actually holding all things together so we don't have to. David understood this. David understood this. In Psalm 3 verse 5, David says, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. He said in, in Psalm 4 verse 8, he said, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. See, David could rest securely because he knew that the Lord is in control. He knew that the Lord would sustain him and keep him. Well, beloved, you can have that assurance too. Because Jesus is in control of all things. He's holding all things together, including you, including your family, including your work, including your life. So trust Him. Trust Him enough to, to get some sleep. Trust Him enough to, to get some rest. Trust Him enough to, to go take a nap and rest. I listened to this quote by John Piper, and he, he helps us to see that, that sleep is a sign of, of, of us trusting in God's sovereignty. Listen to what he says. He says, sleep is a parable that God is God and we are not. God handles the world quite nicely while the hemisphere sleeps. Sleep is like a broken record that comes around with the same message every day. Man is not sovereign. Man is not sovereign. Man is not sovereign. Don't let the lesson be lost on you. God wants to be trusted as the great worker who never tires and never sleeps. He's not nearly so impressed with your late nights and early mornings as he is with your peaceful trust that casts all anxieties on him and sleeps. Are you tired? Are you weary with all of the busyness? Well, then trust the Lord Jesus Christ who is in control, who is holding all things together. Trust in Him and, and get some rest. Get some sleep. But trust Him to take control, to, to lead you into rest. That brings me to my, to my second promise, and we'll spend a bit more time on this one. And that's a well-known passage in Matthew 11, this beautiful passage, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, where Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now what's the promise there? Well, the promise there is beautiful, beautiful rest. 
Jesus gives this wonderful invitation to you to come to him because he alone is able to give you true rest. Now the question to ask is what kind of rest does Jesus give? What kind of rest does he offer in this invitation? Well, the context makes quite clear that the rest that he gives is the rest that accompanies salvation. In verse 27, he says, no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Now, what does that revelation mean? What does it mean to know the father and the son? Well, Jesus tells us in in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, to know the Father and the Son. And so what Jesus offers here is, is rest that comes from having eternal life. And notice what he says in verse 29. By coming to Him, you will find rest, not first and foremost rest for your body, no, rest for your soul. See, the rest that Jesus puts on offer you is the rest that accompanies salvation. The only way your soul will find rest, beloved, is if your soul is at peace with God. If your sins have been forgiven and removed from you. The only way you will find rest is if you are cleansed from the corruption and the guilt of your sin. You can sleep well and and rest all you want, but if your sin is still on you, if the guilt of your sin is still on you, I want to suggest to you, you can sleep all you want, but you won't have rest. You won't have true peace. No, the rest that Jesus gives you is soul-satisfying rest, peace with God that flows out of salvation. J.C. Ryle has an excellent sermon on this passage. And if I may, I want to read you a section from that sermon because I think he, he sums this rest up quite well, better than I ever could. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says. He, he asks the question, what kind of rest does Jesus give? And he says this, he will give you rest from guilt of sin. The sins of the man who comes to Christ are completely taken away. They are forgiven, pardoned, removed, blotted out. They can no longer appear in judgment against him. They are sunk in the depths of the sea. Ah, brethren, that is rest. He says he will give you rest from the fear of the law. The law has no further claim on the man who comes to Christ. Its debts are paid. Its requirements are satisfied. Christ indeed has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And that is rest. He will give you rest from the fear of hell. Hell cannot touch the man who has come to Christ. The punishment has been paid. The pain and the suffering has been undergone by Christ. And the sinner is free. And that too, beloved, is rest. He will give you rest from the fear of the devil. The devil is mighty, but he cannot touch those who come to Christ. Their Redeemer is stronger. Satan may sift and buffet and vex, but he cannot destroy you. Ah, that too is rest. And finally he says, he will give you rest from the fear of death. The sting of death is taken away when a man comes to Christ. Jesus has overcome death and it is a conquered enemy. The believer's soul is safe whatever happens to his body. His flesh flesh rests in hope and this also is rest. Beloved, that's the kind of rest that Jesus offers you. Real, objective, abundant, soul-satisfying rest. Rest that flows from being saved from your sin. Rest that flows from having peace with God. Now, who is this promise of rest for? It is for those who labor and are heavy laden. It is for those who are tired and wearied and, and burdened. See, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees taught that if you want rest, if you want peace with God, then then you need to be religious. You need to do this religious ritual or you need to tick that religious box. And then and then only will you be saved and find happiness in God. Well, in our day, that hasn't changed much either. 
Many people teach today that if you want rest, if you want peace, then you need to live a good moral life. You need to tick the religious boxes. You need to be a hard worker. And then, and then only will you enjoy true peace and happiness with God. And dear friend, you need to realize this, that those expectations will be a burden on your back that will cripple you. They will tie you out and devastate you. Why? Because you are human and you are sinful. Even your most righteous deeds before a holy God is polluted by sin. You can try all you want, but you cannot save yourself. You can try all you want, but you cannot bring rest to yourself by your deeds. No, rest and peace are only to be found in this Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gives you this invitation to give you soul-satisfying rest. Rest from your sin, rest from the punishment and condemnation that rests on your sin. And so it's only by turning to this Jesus in faith and repentance that your soul will find rest. Now, why point out this promise to you? Why, why bring this promise out to you? Let's say you're a Christian. Let's say you've been saved from your sin. Let's say you have peace with God. How does this promise give you rest physically? How does this promise give you strength in your struggles day to day? Well, this text matters because it points us to the source of our rest. This text matters because it points us to the source of our rest and how we ought to approach that rest. As we come to Christ in faith, we receive real, objective, soul-satisfying rest and peace with God. Now, I would argue, I would argue that from that real, objective, soul-satisfying rest flows real, subjective, soul-strengthening rest. Another way to say that is this, once you have peace with God, that peace with God flows into peace from God, where God gives you rest and strength in your turmoil, in your difficulties, in your trials. Think of it in this way. Think of David again. David, the man after God's own heart. I read Psalm 3 verse 5 earlier where David says, I, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. Well, you need to realize when David said that he was surrounded by enemies. He was surrounded by those who, who wanted the destruction of his soul. He says in verse 6, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. See, David is in the midst of turmoil. He's got enemies all around him, which would have weighed heavy upon his heart, which would have wearied him out. Yet, what, what, what do we see in David? David is able to rest in peace. David is able to enjoy rest and peace in the midst of trial. Why, why is that? Well, David is a man after God's own heart. And who, he is a man who walked closely with the Lord. He walked continually before the face of the Lord. We see that emphasis in Psalm 3. We see how David is focused upon the Lord. In verse 3 we read, But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. See, because David was close to the Lord, he was able to enjoy God's peace and rest even when surrounded by enemies. Now let's get back to what Jesus said. Jesus said, come to me. Now, do you think Jesus meant come to me once off? Come to me once and that's it? No, no. Jesus says, come to me. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. And he says, learn from me. And all of that points us to the fact that Jesus is calling us to a life of discipleship. He's calling us to live a life where we follow him and have a close, intimate relationship with him. And I would suggest to you this. When you live closely to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are found in a lifelong close intimacy and relationship with you, where with Him, and you follow Him and you learn from Him, then you will know rest and peace, even in turmoil. 
I, I learned this lesson when, while being in seminary. Uh, when I was in seminary, I really struggled to balance all the responsibilities. Early mornings and late nights, having to wake up early in the morning to go to classes and come back in the afternoon and have, have assignments, assignments to write and books to read and, and languages to learn. And, and on top of all of that, there was church responsibilities, having to prepare Bible studies and Sunday school lessons. And it was quite a lot for me and I, I struggled initially. And, and when you become so busy, your quiet time often gets snuffed out. And I was struggling with that. Well, well what changed for me was I made this resolution to, to before I do any work in the afternoon, when I, as soon as I get home, before any other work, after I had something to eat, to have an hour and a half of quiet time with the Lord, where I read the word and I pray. And I found when I made that a habit, of that regular, habitual time with the Lord, dedicated time, I managed to, to cope with all the other responsibilities. I managed to do those responsibilities well. And, and the point I'm trying to get is this, is this, when you honor the Lord by spending time with Him, when you honor the Lord by being in close, intimate relationship with Him, learning from Him and following Him, then He gives you the strength you need. Then He gives you the rest you need to persevere through all your trials. May I suggest to you, some of you might be tired and weary, not because you lack sleep, but because you haven't spent enough time with the Lord. You lack strength and you lack rest because, because you haven't spent time in His Word and in prayer, in intimate fellowship and relationship with Him. Beloved, this promise matters for us because Jesus is saying, I am the source of rest. Come to me and find rest. Listen to this quote by a pastor from the 18th century. He, he describes this well, I think. He said this, there is no rest for the Christian in this world. There will always be something to disturb, something to perplex, something to distress you. It's an enemy's land after all. But then he says this, but when Jesus says, I will give you rest, he assures us that our sins are forgiven, that we are safe in his keeping, that his presence will always be with us, and that all things shall work for our good. We can rest, therefore, in his faithfulness because he has been tried and be found faithful. We can rest in His love, for He loves us to the uttermost. We can rest in His power, for His power is ever engaged on our behalf. We can rest in His blood, for it speaks peace and pardon and acceptance with God. And we can rest at His feet, for there we are safe, and nothing can injure us. If you're tired, and if you're weary through all the trials and difficulties of this life, then you need to be close to Christ. You need to come to Him again daily, intimately, to learn from Him and be in His presence. Because it's as we come to Him that we not only find objective, soul-satisfying peace, but it's as we spend time with Him in His Word, in prayer, communing with Him in fellowship, then we find real subjective peace, peace that gives us strength and rest in the difficulties we face. So if you're tired, if you're weary, turn to Christ. Be close to Him. And I've spent a lot of time on that second promise. Let me conclude with this third promise and look at it very briefly. The third promise is found in Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 and there Paul says, and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. What's the promise there? Well the promise there is, is a reward. It's a reward. Our work will produce a fruitful harvest. Our work is not in vain. Makes me think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, where he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 
So the promise is this. Despite your, despite your work being hard and arduous and tiresome, our work is not in vain. Rather, it is producing a fruitful harvest. Matthew Henry once said, the devil visits the idol with his temptations, but God visits the industrious with his favors. Or well, if you work hard, it is not to waste. But we need to ask the question, what or for who is that promise? Is the promise there for any kind of work? No, that's not what the text says. That's not what the, not what the promise is. The promise says it is for those who do not grow weary in doing good. Now, what kind of work is good work? Is it gospel work like preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel with your friends? Well, yes, it's that kind of work. Is, is it social work? Is it caring for the needy, caring for the poor? Yeah, it's, it's that work. But I would say it's a lot more than just that. When we look at Paul's view of work, we see that all work ought to be done ultimately for God and His glory. That's Paul's view of work. In Colossians 3.17, Paul says this, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. A few verses later, he says, in verse 23 and 24, he says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And see, the point is simply this. All we do, all the work that we're responsible for, all of it ought to be done for the glory and honor of the Lord. After all, are we not His? Do we not belong body and soul to Him? See, all that we do, no matter what work that is, ought to be done for the Lord. Uh, William Tyndale said this, and this quote might upset some pastors, but he said this, at the end of the day, there is no difference between the person who preaches and the person who washes dishes when both of those are doing their work to the honor and pleasure of the Lord. It was Martin Luther that said, sometimes those who, who wash dishes are honoring God more than those who preach the word, because sometimes those who preach the word do it for their own honor. And see, the point to get is this, the good work isn't just gospel work. It isn't just uh, social work. No, it is all work that is done for the purpose of serving Christ and honoring God. That's the good work. And the promise, I think, is this. If your motive is to honor and serve and glorify God in your work, no matter what that work is, that work is not in vain. That work isn't pointless. No, that work is fruitful. Why? Because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the Lord. And therefore, it is fruitful. Therefore, it is meaningful. Now, why suggest this promise to you? Why bring this promise to you for your consideration? Well, isn't it true that when we get tired and, and when we get weary, we often face the temptation to, in all the busyness, to just give up. We get tired and we get, we get distressed and discouraged and we just want to give up. And sometimes that even happens in the life of the church. We get busy and we just want to give it all up. Well, this promise matters because God is saying in this promise, even though you're tired, even though you're weary, although the work is hard, don't give up. Don't give, don't become slothful. Don't give in to idleness. No, keep serving the Lord. Keep doing it all for Him. Keep honoring the, the Lord in your work. Because when it's done for Him, when it's done in service to Him for His honor, it's not in vain. It's not pointless. It's not meaningless. No, it's for His glory. And, and I want to suggest to you, in fact, when you do your work for God's glory, when you do it with the motive of serving Him and honoring Him, then often God gives you the strength to do that work. 
then often God gives you the strength and the rest you need to persevere in that work. And isn't that what we see in, in Isaiah 40? They who wait for the Lord, they shall renew their strength. See, if you're tired and you're weary and you're wondering how you're going to make it, then set your hands to serve the Lord in His strength. You will not faint and grow weary when you rest your hands and you rest in His strength. And so those are some of the promises I want to give to you uh, in this message. The Lord Jesus Christ holds all things together. The Lord Jesus Christ gives the soul, soul satisfying, objective and subjective rest. The Lord Jesus Christ rewards those who serve him. And therefore, given all these promises, beloved, wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord who is in control. Walk near to the Lord who, who gives rest, who, who comes near to you in your struggles. Wait upon the Lord. Work for the Lord. Work for His honor. Work for His glory. And He will give you the strength you need. He will give you the rest you so desire. But you need to wait upon Him. You need to walk with Him. You need to work for His glory. And He will give you the rest. Although you are faint and weary, He is not. He will give you the rest and the strength that you need. So I pray the Lord would encourage us and strengthen us, even in these difficult days, for the glory of His name. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank You for Your promises. I want to thank You that You do not faint or grow weary. You are not like man who is weak and frail and often lacking in strength. But thank you, dear Lord, that we can look to you and find strength in you and find rest in you. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he is in control. He holds all things together. We want to thank you that he gives rest, real, satisfying, soul-satisfying rest. And that he rewards those who, who work faithfully for him. And so, dear Lord, help us to wait upon him, to walk with him in close fellowship and to work for his glory in all things. To the praise and honor of your name we pray. Amen.